In this week's show, we discuss the most exciting news from the Mobile World Congress event in Barcelona. We also plan our trip to the upcoming wearable tech show in London. As well as discussing the science behind Apple's new waterproof technology. As well as give tips on how to get young girls, yes, young girls, interested in programming. This is Luke Besant and Cameron Norris. Every week we bring you the latest industry news, must-have reviews, gadgets and internet culture. Giving our opinions on the wider legal, social and moral implications of life in our digital age. This, this is App to Date. <laughs> Opening the industry news section, Luke, would you like to get started off with Google Partners SoftCard? So Google have revealed plans to team up with SoftCard, the smartphone payment service, in order to increase competition with Currency and Apple Pay. Google Wallet will come with a pre-installed Tap to Pay app. This app will be appearing on Android smartphones sold in the US market by AT&T. T-Mobile and Verizon as part of the deal with the carrier's mobile payments company Softcard. Google will also receive intellectual property from Softcard in order to further improve the Google Wallet. So staying with corporate acquisitions, Apple acquires music software maker Camel Audio. Camel Studio is a popular music creation software. They create things such as plugins, virtual synthesizers, effects and sound libraries for major doors, that's digital audio workstations, just like the one we're using right now. It is presumed that the purchase will mean that Camel Audio technologies may be used in future versions of Logic Pro X, Apple software for professional musicians, or maybe even GarageBand. I like a bit of GarageBand. I've had to play around on GarageBand every now and then. No, it's not really for me to be honest. I've been I've been using Logic Pro for so many years now. I don't know where I'd be without it. <laughs> Uh, next up, BBM for Android hits over a hundred million downloads on Google Play. Well, this is quite an amazing story actually, because we can be kind of downplaying BlackBerry, but on Wednesday they announced that its popular BBM Messenger app for Android has touched a milestone of 100 million downloads or well installs since its launch on the platform in October 2013. The firm also added that around 65% of the total 2.4 million reviews for the app were positive and were rated 5 star. So do you want to give us a quote here, Luke, from the company? Of course, Android is just one of the four platforms on which BBM is now available. The others, of course, are BlackBerry, iOS and Windows Phone. So while over 100 million installs is a big number, it's just a fraction of the total, the company's blog post stated. Well, they're being very, uh, very, very humble. They're very egotistical, I think, isn't that? Well, they, I mean, they were. I mean, they're kind of saying... It's hey, only a fraction. 100 well, million. <laughs> <laughs> kind of firmly planting their feet on the ground because they realised that BlackBerry, you know, it's had its time, but the BlackBerry Messenger... I remember when people used to say, oh, can you send me your BBM? So like, I had no idea what that was. Yeah, but you're talking about this nostalgically. You're saying it in the past tense already. Of Are course, you saying they're yeah. making a comeback? BBM is making a comeback, definitely. Okay, the reinsurgence. The re well, the figures at the moment certainly prove that they've been doing well for the last few months, but I don't know if that necessarily means they're making like this all-time comeback where they're going to be the, the big dog again. I think they'll slowly fizzle out as an entire corporation and go, uh, I think they should, you know, play, play to their strong points do what IBM did and just become the people who make the other stuff for other people. Yeah, well, moving on, uh, the future of iPhones could be waterproof. Now, Apple have been granted a new patent that aims to make electronic components within a computing device water resistant. If successful, this move could set iPhones apart from other waterproof smartphones already available. How, you ask? Waving your perfectly waterproof Samsung Galaxy S5 in the air? Because I know there's going to be plenty of listeners doing that right now. Yeah. Well, up until now, mobile devices have required a much bulkier casing to remain waterproof. So Samsung Galaxy S5, for example, is water resistant because its case just simply doesn't allow water to get inside. But what Apple have noticed is that while bulky cases have some degree of success in preventing water entering and protecting the electrical components from exposure to that water, the protective case is pretty much of little to no value once water's actually got inside the device housing. I mean, I don't know how many times people have had this kind of happen. I've heard advice such as, oh, you've, you've dropped your phone in the bath, um, put it in a Tupperware case of rice, and it will be okay. See, the problem is, yeah, uh, with, su such as with the Galaxy S5, if you get water on the inside, because of the way that the actual case is designed, it's you're in. stuck on the inside. Exactly, the water is locked in. And I think Apple have kind of identified this and 
Their patent is really interesting. So what I've done is I've done a bit of research into waterproofing and what I suspect Apple will be using. And the technology is a form of nanotechnology, yes, scary word, nanotechnology, which is being used to create a form of super hydrophobic material designed to repel water in the exact same way nature does. And it does this actually by creating a barrier of trapped air on the surface of the material. So to try and get your head around this, think of some natural examples like duck feathers, butterfly wings, and even lotus leaves, which are actually one of the most water resistant surfaces in all of nature. Now these materials excel at repelling water and it's thanks to a microscopic texture on their surface, which is completely invisible to the human eye. And Apple, Apple are actually going to be seeking to artificially create this. Now there's a number of products on the market already, which you can, you can spray onto I mean, your clothing onto your electrical goods and dip them in water or throw water on them. And they cause the water to kind of bead and almost float on the surface because, I mean, technically it is floating over this, this very thin surface of air and it's absolutely amazing. So I would love to see what happens with it. Just uh, regressing back there, the word hydrophobic. Hydrophobic. That's a bit over the top, That's isn't it? That's a great really? word. Hydrophobic <laughs> material. That is the, the scientific word for it, yeah. Luke. Hydrophobic. Yeah. Well, I think it's pretty fascinating. <laughs> you know, can you imagine that? It's, it's raining. Rather than grab an umbrella, you get your hydrophobic spray and you just give yourself a good shh all over. You go out in the rain. Just hydrophobic hairspray. Is that where you're going? It. Hydrophro... I can barely pronounce the word. You better, you better put your painting on it now. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, if I'm going to learn anything from Apple. <laughs> So it was International Women's Day on Sunday, so we thought we'd mark the occasion by featuring a story on getting girls more interested in programming. Now, this isn't as sexist as it may sound, but David Miller, a software engineer at Google, has said that he wants to get girls, and young women particularly, interested in programming. And to kick things off, he started with his three daughters, all of whom he's now taught to code. And apparently some of these girls even started at like three years old, which admittedly, I do find kind of hard to believe even for a Google employee, but that's, you know, that's how the story goes. It's a nice story, isn't it? It's a nice story, isn't it? Yeah. You can just imagine it, can't you? The, the Google employee dad coming home and teaching his daughter how to... Right, turn off Pe Peppa Pig. <laughs> let me, Peppa let me teach you about, <laughs> let me teach you about variable and <laughs> tangents. <or. laughs> well, yeah, you can imagine it, can't you? Well, Apparently, uh, Miller has said that the success he's experienced in teaching his daughters programming is all thanks to helping them achieve a particular mindset. And he's described this mindset as getting them to a place where they want to know how to make the computer do what they want it to do. So he set all kinds of weird tasks. So he's got his daughter who's interested in music, so he's set her tasks with using programming to solve problems with, you know, things that she wants to do with sounds digitally and kind of inspiring them based on other interests rather than programming for programming's sake. So if you're a mum or dad and you'd like to encourage your daughter, you know, or your son to code, uh, we have a few tools and recommendations made by Miller himself. Uh, and the first of these is a website called pencilcode.net. Uh, now this site basically helps fledgling coders get their head around coding by dragging and dropping blocks of code represented by cool graphics in order to create a game or music or whatever they want. And they can even toggle between the graphics and the actual code to better understand how it all fits together. Next up, Code.org have teamed up with Disney to create a new tutorial that features Anne and Elsa from Frozen. I sound really like I know all about Frozen. Anne and Elsa from Frozen, don't I? Good old buddies. Uh, yeah, let it go. Uh, this <laughs> tutorial introduces young girls to basic coding concepts while keeping them entertained by their favourite Disney characters. It's a good idea, I think. Yeah. Yeah, well done Disney. Disney have been doing some cool things recently. And well, I mean, I'm no Google employee, but I do have a personal recommendation. And that's actually Scratch. It's a program called Scratch, or a website. Um, and this is another great drag and drop coding platform for kids, which allows them to program their own interactive stories, games, animations, whatever you can think of, and then share those creations with a closely monitored online community. It's, it's really good. There's all kids making all kinds of stuff. It's really great to see. And I, I actually used this to quickly prototype a game demo I made for college uh, back when I knew practically nothing about coding. And it was actually quite enjoyable, even for me. So I think I think Barclays used that as the backbone for their coding school, didn't they? 
Have they used to scratch it though? I'm pretty sure, don't quote me on that. And I mean, this is going out to quite a few people, so I'm putting my neck on the line. <laughs> but uh, I believe they did, yeah. Yeah, well, it's really good. It really is good. I mean, if it's got Barclays backing, Barclays banking, um, it, it is good. Um, and I definitely think this is something that parents and children can use to kind of work together. And the parents, will, yeah, I'm sure they'll enjoy it too. So moving on from there, we jumped on the Mobile World Congress hashtag last week, didn't we? Well, we jumped on the Mobile World Congress hashtag last Wednesday to check out the reasons for all the fuss on Twitter. And we're sure glad we did, because there have been some really exciting news released. Uh, first of all was a prototype of Google's Project Aura, the modular phone. You may remember modular phones became very popular for about ooh, half a week last year when a phone blocks video came out that was literally... Uh, I guess it was a proof of concept video? Essentially. Yeah, yeah, okay. I think their Kickstarter kind of got hijacked actually by Google. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's yeah. quite a sad story. So yeah, that's the story of Google Project or a modular smartphone which can currently fit 11 components onto its frame. The concept is being promoted as a way of reducing electronic waste as currently 20 to 50 million metric tons of e-waste are deposited worldwide every year. It's pretty shocking. That is a shocking amount. It's a lot less than I thought it was. Do you think? Is that... 50 yeah, million a metric, metric ton. tons. Yeah, it's a metric ton, yeah. It's a lot of kind of microchips. Yeah. You know, that's, that's a, a lot, lot of gold. Of, yeah, that's a lot of gold. <laughs> yeah, platinum, all of that a lot. Yeah, cash for that. Well, there's a film that's just come out recently, actually, about kids in Brazil whose entire life, really, is scavenging on these scrapyards for you know, electrical components where they can rip out the gold, melt it down and try and sell it. And I, I don't remember the name of the film, which is really unfortunate because it looks absolutely amazing and people would love it. The event also featured a really nice operating system named Sailfish OS, developed by a Finnish startup named Jola, who won the best tablet award thanks to their innovative OS. Sailfish has since been described as a gesture-based operating system with no physical buttons. Instead, it takes advantage of a creative and easy-to-use system of swipes. So, you know, phone users, you'll be used to this. Now, Sailfish has also been designed to allow users to replace physical parts of their devices too, making it a prime candidate to power future modular mobile technology. I think there's a really, really bright outlook for this Finnish startup, and I think that Sailfish is... It's going to fly, really. Yeah. They have a great website as well. And have you noticed there's these kind of uh, animal-based technology names? Firefox, Sailfish. Um, that's yeah. two examples, yeah, that's but you know... Yeah, two examples, but yeah, I know where you're coming you from. You know, yeah. yeah, and they, they, they just... Well, Blackberry, Apple. Yeah, exactly. It's nature. I, I think it's kind of making technology something more relatable and uh, less aggressive, because I think technology overall is quite an aggressive kind of theme yeah yeah and it just softens it a bit which you know sailfish yeah. skynet <laughs> yeah <laughs> exactly there were also some luxury smart watches on show there from lg uh go into the more refined and traditional look with fancy leather straps and classic clock faces there was also talk about how 5g was going to play an enormous part in the future of internet of things and finally, virtual reality goggles were at a surprising number of exhibits this year, and the technology certainly appears to be picking up mainstream public interest. I, I think I think there's a massive problem here with these virtual reality headsets. I think it's beginning to get the uh, vibe that 3D cinema keeps getting, where it reinsurges for a while and then disappears for like four years, and then something groundbreaking will come along, like uh, well, in my example, Avatar, or in this case, uh, the Oculus Rift, uh, and then it just disappears again. Well, Steam have now put up an announcement on their gaming client that they are going to be releasing their VR headset and that you can, you can basically subscribe for early access information. Um, and I think that when this takes off, especially with Steam OS, we're going to see this really geared for gamers. I think the cinema aspect of it, I mean, how would you direct a film where the person can walk around with what's going on? How would you limit that? I mean, there's, there's so many variables it's just impossible to kind of manage and i don't think anything of real substantial value is going to come out of this uh, vr cinema i think it might be great as a kind of static interactive experience but i don't think for films i think for games though amazing could be amazing well what they could do is up the level of 3d cinema with them 
of that virtual reality headset. So I suppose if you were sat still and you could maneuver your head properly in a 3D oh movie, that would uh, that would maybe do a little bit of a reinsurgence. And uh, the, the movie industry, uh, well, the cinematic industry has certainly got enough money for it at the moment. Yeah, I mean, the thing is, though, I kind of like looking at the expressions of the person sitting next to me. Yeah, you know what I mean? that, is, that is a big part of the cinema-going experience. In fact, it's what they sold to us in the name of anti-piracy, was the experience of going to the cinema and... Yeah, exactly. Throwing popcorn at people. Uh, so we're heading up to the wearable tech conference in London on Wednesday, where we'll be hoping... To try on some Predator arm gauntlets of death. Because we all know that Predator is the undisputed king of wearable tech, don't we? I mean, yeah, of course. you've seen the films. Yeah, I've seen, seen the films. films. So on Wednesday, we'll be heading over to the Wearable Technology Show in London, and this event is set to be the world's largest expo and conference for wearable technology in the world. And here we'll get to meet and hear from some of the top names in wearables, augmented reality, and Internet of Things. I can't wait. Another cool thing is that the Augmented Reality Show, which is Europe's largest independent event for AR and VR, has been co-located with the Wearable Technology Show. So Wednesday there is going to be so much going on. I know the show's actually going on for a few more days. It's not just Wednesday, but Wednesday's when we're going up. So if you're there, give us a shout out on Twitter. Maybe we can meet up. That would be fantastic. Yeah, definitely yeah. give us a shout out on Twitter. We are at iOS App News 24. Uh, or alternatively, you can get in contact with us via our new Twitter avatar, which is at App to Date Podcast. Uh, you can get in touch with me personally at Besant T-U-D. Speaking of which the future of industrial Internet of Things might actually be wearables. Now, there has been a lot of debates online with people claiming that the industrial uses for Internet of Things will rapidly overtake consumer usage, which includes smart homes and wearables, but others saying that this will never happen. So, we've decided to take a look for ourselves. Now, what we've discovered is actually kind of obvious, um, <laughs> and that's that industrial hardware changes only happen over a period of years or more. For example, for example, a stretch of train track may last several decades before requiring replacement or a major servicing. So if you're managing lots of expensive, already reliable systems spread over a large area, you're really not going to bother investing in something as rapidly changing as Internet of Things. To get around this problem and break into the industrial Internet of Things world, a startup called DAQRI have created the world's first smart helmet designed exclusively for the industrial workplace. Well, recently, I would say that we've been through what I would call a digital revolution. Are we saying that we're about to go through a second industrial revolution based on the back of the technology that's been created in the digital one? Maybe, that's cool. I really like that. Potentially. Um, I think there's a lot of room for this technology to really change the workplace. I mean, we could have kind of programming-based health and safety where everything's measured. I mean, this helmet, it, it, I mean, it basically includes an industrial-grade inertial measurement unit, a high-resolution 3D depth camera, and 360 navigation cameras. So, I mean, it knows where you are, what you're doing, and what's going on around it. Maybe some people will feel like their privacy is being slightly overstepped in the workplace, but I can see a lot of, you know, kind of safety uses for this. I could certainly see a lot of insurance benefits to it. I mean, it, it also supports HD video recording, photography, 3D mapping, and alphanumeric capture, which actually allows the device to read and understand signage and instrument data. I mean, talk about supercharging your workforce. You could be working out calculations that are written down. It's like photo math. In your face. On steroids. I mean, so for me, I think the future of industrial IoT appears to be leaning heavily towards enhancing individuals rather than the workplace itself. Because, you know, as we've said, it's just too expensive to keep updating physical workplace infrastructure, but it's not too expensive to kind of, you know, equipped your employees with some fancy smart helmets. Uh, so we'll be keeping our eye on this one to see if our prediction comes true. One of my major grievances with this is that I, I've always found that whenever I've done anything that involves any manner of manual labour or you know any standard run-of-the-mill physical job, that I've always been bogged down by health and safety and there's been too much equipment on me. Like I used to work on ships and in order to man certain life rafts, you'd have to have so much equipment to attached to you, you feel like you're anchored down. And I think that adding to that amount of equipment, maybe it's not for the benefit of the people, it's more for the benefit of the insurance papers. Well then hopefully this kind of technology will, I mean, as most smart technology is doing at the moment, will combine all these different 
things that you need to have on you, you know, into one product that you can just wear. Um, and it doesn't need to be separated into, oh, well, you need this to get on this boat and this to do this and that to do that because it'll all be in one device. Hopefully it'll just be something like, a, you know, a Bluetooth headset, which does all these amazing things. But at the moment, it's not quite there, is it? You always have to have one in the back up, though. I mean, I'm imagining a VR spirit gauge. Okay. Imagine you're a carpenter. Yeah. You put these, these goggles on. You don't need a spirit gauge. Completely hands-free. You can suss out everything at the correct angles. Work it out with your alphanumeric detection. That's a good idea. Yeah, yeah. I'm liking your idea. Thanks. Every carpenter I know would go, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. <laughs> <laughs> so we have a listener's question next. A listener's question, everybody. Do I need antivirus for my iPhone? Okay, so we're going to use this question as an opportunity to debunk a few uh, of the most common myths regarding iOS security. Well, so far, iOS malware has followed a similar pattern to what happens with Android. So first of all, jailbroken devices were hit with malware, and this gradually moved on to non-jailbroken devices, and then finally the malware started appearing in the official app store. Yes, guys, there is malware in official app stores. It's kind of scary, but I mean, the interesting thing is that Android hasn't actually been hacked more than iOS because it's more secure. The interesting thing is though, that Android hasn't been hacked more than iOS because iOS is more secure, but simply because Hackers are actual, logical human beings, and Android has been so much more popular in the world than iOS. I mean, think about the numbers. So it would make perfect sense as a hacker to spend all your time and effort targeting the largest platform first. And this is why we're now starting to see more iOS hacks and attacks. Now, the first piece of iOS malware appeared back in 2009. It was called Ike, and all it did was change your iPhone wallpaper background to a photo of Rick Astley. Yep, a Rick Roll hack attack. Love it. <laughs> so back to the question, does your iPhone need an antivirus for protection other than to keep Bono off your phone? <laughs> well, the official word from Apple is no. Uh, according to Apple, iOS doesn't leave room for malware to get into the system in the first place. And that if you use your iPhone as intended, then the only place you can get applications from is through the App Store. And everything that goes through the App Store is rigorously checked to make sure that it contains no malicious code. Now, a lot of hacks that we've discussed previously on the show rely on the iOS PDF display code exploit. And as far as I'm aware, this exploit works on every single iPhone, from the original, even through to the iPad Touch and the latest iPad. So basically, my advice would be not to download or try to read PDFs on your iOS device at all, and leave the rest to Apple to patch when the exploits are found, because I mean, quite clearly, they've made it their responsibility. And they've been pretty quick, actually, to fix up patches and sort these things out. I know the PDF exploit was out for a while, and it's potentially still there, but use a bit of common sense. I mean, you know, it's like all things. You can get antivirus up to your eyeballs, slow your phone down so it can barely function and be safe, but... The antivirus becomes a virus in its own right then, doesn't it? Exactly, It's exactly. what used to happen with uh, Norton antivirus on older computers. It, precisely. Norton, I mean, they're notorious for it. it. That's a malware in itself. I mean, that's malware you're paying for. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's sad. That really is sad. I mean, as a final point, actually, um, the US actually declared iPhone jailbreaking legal despite Apple's objections, which it's just interesting, actually. You can jailbreak your iPhone, so you can actually break the Apple end user license agreement by law now, yeah. because it did say that you couldn't jailbreak your devices. And that does open up a lot of risk. I mean, we've dis discussed it with Snapchat, whereas if someone's got a jailbroken iPhone, they can then steal your photos through Snapchat, um, even if you have a secure device with no viruses on it. So it is a little bit worrying, um, but just honestly, just don't waste your money on antivirus because it's just gonna slow down your device performance. Use your common sense and don't use Snapchat with people who have jailbroken devices if you can help it. So our app of the week is Usition. Usition is an application that uses guitar tablature in a pleasantly graphically designed format in order to teach you guitar. It uses uh, YouTube videos to guide you through a step-by-step -step tutorial, teaching you right up to a high-grade, advanced level of guitar. However, if you are looking to start learning guitar, I would recommend this application. If you are already an advanced guitar player and you want to polish your skills, I would say that this necessarily isn't the best platform for you, as you have to do a whole bunch of stuff first to prove that you're good at playing guitar. Uh, it's like unlocking levels. but you only get a certain amount of levels before you have to start paying them and the premium second tier membership is £119. That being said, 
keep in mind that some people pay ridiculous amount of money for music lessons and for some people that's like two music lessons yeah. <laughs> which absolutely blows my mind that anybody pays that much but no you're absolutely right luke i mean <laughs> the, the only the only downside of this application that i can really think of is it doesn't really teach you how to play sheet music as such it only really teaches you how to play their way of playing something so pretty much limited to whatever's in their library that being said it is our app of the week and if you're a beginner guitarist check it out it's quite good and staying on the topic of music we also have a device of the week this week and that is instrument one now this device is pretty amazing it's essentially a blank wired up fretboard programmed with as many instrument presets as you can possibly think of now all you need to do is connect the instrument one to your iPhone, iPad, Mac or even PC and it will output any sound based on any running MIDI application. Uh, and the device's automated modes also let you make melodies on any instrument despite not knowing how to play it. Oh, oh, it's oh. Pretty cool. I think for the first time in this show I know what something stands for that you might not. Go on Luke. MIDI. On. I have no idea. Yeah! <laughs> Music interface, Ooh, digital close, yeah. input. <laughs> yeah, that is so close. Is that close? Oh, it's so close. Yeah. Musical instrument, digital interface. Oh, that's close. Nice. <laughs> so, Luke, come on. You've got this amazing new hardware in the studio today, which kind of loosely relates to this. So, you want to rift on it? You want to rift on this amazing piece of technology I see before me? Seriously, it looks like the control panel of the Starship Enterprise. <laughs> so, yeah, we've bought ourselves a new audio interface. So you may realise that this week the audio might be a little bit off because we're playing around with essentially what is an entirely new audio rig here in the studio. I bought myself a new audio interface, essentially, uh, from Avenue Studios over in Camberley. It's beautiful. In it's it is beautiful. a beautiful bit of kit. It's the 003 Rack Plus. Yeah, I just thought I'd chuck that in there. Um, well, going back to this Instrument One device, uh, you know, I've, I've gone on about using these MIDI applications and melodies and all this lot, but, you know, what does that actually mean? Um, well, I've described it in uh, typical Cameron fashion, which okay. is uh, that this device is like the Pokemon Polygon. Banned from TV. <laughs> banned from TV, yeah. Soon to be banned from the App Store. Well, okay, so basically, with the Instrument One, you tell it what you need it to be, and it will go ahead and do just that. You need a guitar, you need a guitar, you've got a guitar, you need a banjo, you've got a banjo, you need a harp, you've got a harp, you need a dubstep cannon, you've got one of those too. Luke, can you tell us more about the MIDI, MIDI applications and you know what this actually means? Well, MIDI is essentially a, it's a digital Sorry, I'll put you on the spot there yeah. in another little bit. So, as you put me on the spot, straight off the top of my head, I have not Sorry got any again. sort of script here. No, I'm just going to run fine. wildly into the dark. <laughs> uh, MIDI is a, sends a series of digital signals down a cable, uh, instructing device B upon the instructions of device A. It makes no musical sound of its own. It only plays on the sounds and the sound banks of the MIDI module, which could be a computer in most cases these days. Oh, all right, cool. Oh, yeah. Thanks. That was good. Yeah. I, I literally threw that question at him there. He had no idea it was coming. <laughs> yeah, there's a, I, could, I could tell you a whole bunch of technical stuff if you'd like. It sends 127 signals in order to calculate velocity. No, it, I, there's loads of stuff behind it. <laughs> <laughs> Considering you're on a riff there, Luke, how about we enter... The opinion section. And you can tell us a bit more about this dating app Tinder, which is launching a premium subscription plan. So you may already be familiar with it, and if you're not, you've been living on the moon with your fingers in your ears on the dark side. Uh, the popular hookup app Tinder, which allows smartphone users to find partners by swiping on a picture of them, left for no, right for yes, has launched a premium paid version of the service. Tinder Plus has subscription fees tiered by age and country. In the US, users under 30 will pay $9.99 a month, whereas older subscribers will pay $19.99 a month, according to a spokeswoman. Prices will be as low as $2.99 in emerging markets. I'll read an exact quote here. We've priced Tinder Plus based on a combination of factors, including what we've learned through our testing, and we found that these price points were adopted very well by certain age demographics. And that was Tinder Plus spokeswoman Rosetta Pambakian. 
She also said in her statement that lots of products offer differentiated price tiers by age, like Spotify does for students, for example, and that Tinder is no different, and that drawing their testing, they've learned, and not surprisingly, that younger users are just as excited about Tinder Plus, but are more budget constrained and so need a lower price to pull the trigger. Well, that's very aggressive. Yeah. Pull the, uh, the Tinder trigger. She sounds like a... Right, Cougar, this one. <laughs> so essentially the difference between this and Tinder is that this version, uh, you have access to two more requested features. Uh, it's called Undo and Passport. The undo feature allows to take back a swipe. So if you swipe no on somebody that you liked the look of, you can go back and swipe yes, which you can't do on the current version of Tinder. Uh, and the second one is called Tinder Passport. Passport allows you to change your geographical location to match to other people around you. So at the moment, it tracks where you are based on your location from your phone. Uh, and then shows you all the single people in the area and you can swipe right or swipe left if you want a cheeky hookup. But you can change your location on this version. You could say that you're in Spain uh, and you could actually be in London and you could hook up next week whilst you're in Spain. Thinking in advance. Thinking in advance, brilliant. Yeah. So with apps like Tinder, perspective daters can see pictures of people who are nearby. If they like someone, they can swipe right. If people both swipe right on each other's profiles, they can contact each other. If you swipe up, do they get put into the maybe list? <laughs> yeah, they should probably. They have should a maybe do that. List. Come on, Tinder, sort it out. Come on, that would be that would be Tinder plus plus. Yeah, twenty nine ninety nine a month. So, Luke, the question this week is: Should Tinder should Tinder base their prices on age? See, I think it's interesting how they're opening with the two price system. If I was them, I would have changed. I would have started charging a flat rate depending on location. And then maybe a month down the line, I would have offered like a student discount or something to that effect. At the moment, it feels like they're actually charging older people extra because they're saying, oh, the older you are, the less attractive you are, the more you should pay kind of thing. Whereas, you know, it's, it's not, oh, here, you're a poor student. I have this discount. It's the opposite. It feels like they're overcharging somebody because this service didn't exist last week. You know, it, yeah, that's it. they've just made up the prices off the top of their head, and it feels like they're just charging older people for the sake of maybe you have more money, so we'll charge you more. Is yeah. it? If the world worked like that, other than in taxing systems, then uh, <laughs> what a weird world we'd live in. Uh, you want that wham bar? It's going to be two pound for you, mate. <laughs> it's a barrier to entry. A barrier to entry. Exactly. You know, so a lot of. Reports have been calling this a dating website, which makes me laugh because it's a hookup site, really. It's because it's not about dating. It's this shallow as a shower, face value, would you, yes, right, no, left kind of thing. It's, it's not a dating app. So if, if you're looking for a dating app, try maybe Match.com, something like that. Uh, and if you're just looking for a cheeky one around the back of the bushes, this is the app for you, <laughs> Tinder Plus. It panders to the uh, instantaneous gratification generation that we're becoming, that you can oh, swipe God. right or swipe left on potential partners, doesn't it? <laughs> it's kind of sad, isn't it? It's a weird actually. world we live in, but yeah. that being said, thank you very much. I've been Luke Besson. I will sign out just after I say okay. the first Tinder baby. <laughs> uh. <laughs> I've been Cameron Norris. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much for listening to App Today this week. You've been listening to the App Today podcast. Follow us on Twitter at iOS App News 24. Find us on Facebook, the App Today podcast, where you can catch up with the latest show notes, artwork, and discussions, and more. We also offer a free weekly email news summary, which you can sign up for through the Facebook page. And if you're interested in sponsoring or a partnership with the show, make sure you visit our website, www.3deal.co.uk, for more information. Subscribe, and we'll see you next week. Yeah. Oh, 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 oh,